Welcome, everyone, to the inaugural Geneva debate. Thank you, everyone, to come in. This evening happens because a team of students wish to bring contribution from the Graduate Institute in the debate around the vaccination against COVID-19. Uh, discussions are f flowing from all around the world uh, uh, on this issue. A special welcome to the director, Marie Lossal. Special welcome to Madame Ruth Refus, former Conseiller Federal, and as far I remember, la première femme, the first woman to have lead, to have lead our Swiss government. I welcome also the panel, the panel of judges, Professor Suri Moon, Mrs. Kritika Kanicho, Professor Mahmoud Mohamedou, Professor David Silvan, and also uh, Mario Ramirez, who are seated in front of me. I have also to congratulate the organizing, the organizing team, which has worked so hard to make this evening possible. A little bit later, we will welcome the debaters on this stage, but at first, I now ask Mrs. Sal to come to the stage to open this event. Madame la Directrice, s'il vous plaît, la parole est à vous. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Mian. Good evening and welcome to the inaugural Geneva debate. Dear students, dear colleagues, dear friends of the Institute, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great, great pleasure to welcome you to the Maison de la Paix today, whether here in the Amphitheatre or online. A bit less than 100 years ago, the Graduate Institute was founded in Geneva on the ashes of a mass war and a global pandemic that left the world in chaos. Peace was the project of the Institute then, the vision that animated it, in close resonance to the mission of the League of Nations. Today again, we have entered an age of radical uncertainty. Threats to our common home, our oikos, our natural environment, unsustainable inequalities leading to disruptive political dynamics, a digital janus that is testing our ability to trust one another, and on top of everything, a microorganism that has disrupted our systems and our lives with lasting consequences. The challenges we collectively face could leave us hopeless. But through these challenges, we can and we should find opportunities. The future is never fully predetermined. We have to reinvest its projection, its construction, and work together towards our own collective reinvention. The Geneva debate is an initiative by our students at the Graduate Institute that precisely goes in that direction. I would like to start by thanking the Giza Lafayette group that has been very busy for months now preparing for this event. A big thank you to all the students who will participate tonight. Let me also thank Mr. Marcel Mion, who has accepted to moderate today's event. And naturally, a very big thank you, dear President Dreyfus. Um, in your great generosity, you've accepted to be, in some sense, the godmother of this year's event. I want to congratulate in advance all seven students who will debate tonight. The journey you're about to embark on requires not only courage, it also calls for respect, humility, empathy. No side has a monopoly on truth. It may be at times uncomfortable to acknowledge that, but not, acknowledge it, not acknowledging it is a dead end. So no matter who holds the Lafayette Cup later tonight, you will all be winners as you will all have contributed to enriching our perspective on complex issues to opening up our internal black boxes. I am, and this is a very general claim, very proud of our students at the Graduate Institute. I'm amazed by their stamina, by their motivation, their initiative, and their sense of responsibility. Tonight, I'm even more proud to be able to showcase the exceptionality of our students to our community of friends in Switzerland, in international Geneva, and more broadly, in the world. Let me finish by thanking President Dreyfus again and telling her how much she's honoring the Institute and our, ourselves here collectively by being with us tonight. Dear Ruth, the floor is yours.
Madame la directrice Marie-Laure Salle, Monsieur le modérateur euh, Marcel Mion, membres du jury, professeurs, discussants et discussantes, et bien sûr tous ceux qui nous regardent ici à la maison, à Genève ou autour du monde. Je vous souhaite la bienvenue au premier Geneva Debate. Et je suis honorée et heureuse de pouvoir me faire ici tout simplement la porte-parole, le porte-voix des étudiants et des étudiantes de l'Institut. As the Graduate Institute launches this event, we witness the real emergences of a civic tradition that turns out to be more important than ever before. In a world of increasingly invisible threats, a group of students in Geneva have decided to create a platform to share their ideas and solutions on the challenges that they are set to face, preparing themselves to be active members of the International Geneva and advocates for multilateralism. This unique project touches on the spirit that currently unites Geneva, multilateralism, and the young generation. It is a willingness, an energy, to transform this time of unprecedented uncertainty into an opportunity, one that projects a more autonomous, forward-looking, and intersectional vision genevoise of global challenges. This debate is the product of the convic conviction by a group of students at the Graduate Institute that the ideas of the young generation have to be channeled into an ambitious, civic, and constructive dialogue. What started with a brainstorming session during lockdown and became an informal discussion group has converged into the idea to establish a debate. Through great effort and collaboration between students, professors, administrators, and professionals in International Geneva, this idea has ultimately led to the creation of this new platform that we are witnessing today. As former president of the Swiss Confederation, I am delighted to see that our national institutions continue embracing these new ideas to foster the debate and discussion. It also fills me with joy to see that different partners and institutions in Geneva continue to support these projects by guiding students into the pursuit of truth, knowing how essential their ideas are to shape the way that Geneva and Switzerland influence the global conversation. Je tiens également à remercier la directrice de l'Institut des Hautes Études Internationales et du Développement Madame Laure Sali, de Marie-Laure Salle et tous les membres et professeurs de l'Institut qui ont activement contribué à la création de ce nouveau projet. Je suis persuadée que vos efforts, ainsi que ceux des étudiants à la tête du débat, rendront toute la communauté éducative fière d'appartenir à cette institution. Without further ado, I wish you best of luck in a spirit of consensus and understanding to the participants of the first ever Geneva debate, will, which will feature the following motion. La Maison estime que the state should make vaccination against COVID-19 a legal requirement for its residents. Que la discussion commence. Merci, Madame la Conseillère fédérale, pour ce discours introductif. Merci à vous, uh, Madame Sall. So, before we welcome the debaters on this stage, uh, let me shortly explain how uh, the evening is organized. First, uh, that means first, that means now, we will be taking a poll among our audience to know who agrees and who not agrees with the motion. The question is, should the state make vaccination a legal requirement for its residents, or to say it in another manner, 
should vaccination against COVID-19 be mandatory? I call the audience to click uh, the link or the QR code to vote now. And while you give your vote, let me explain the format and the dramaturgy of the debate. So two teams, they are here, will compete. Uh, they will compete giving, we say, alterna giving alternatively uh, proposition for the motion and opposition against the motion. We will follow four rounds. Each speaker, each speaker will have eight minutes, eight minutes maximum, to present his argument. And during the presentation, the other team, if uh, it wishes some more information, can, can raise their hands to obtain more information from the speaker. After these four rounds, the match will be finished and the members of the jury will leave to, to deliberate first on the best individual speaker and secondly, choose the winning team. During this deliberation time, about 20 minutes, we will have a discussion between the debaters and all the followers. The followers will have the opportunity to ask uh, questions or raise any point about the debate. I am sure we will have a um, very exciting debate and deep disagreements on the issue today. And the goal of the discussion should, as you remember, Madame Sal, to create mutual understanding, to reach compromise and find solutions following the intellectual tradition of the graduate. After the discussion, the judges will finally render their verdict. So who win with the debate? Who is the best debater? And the best debater will, will receive a gold medal. Secondly, who is the best team? The winner will receive a cup, the Lafayette Cup, the, the Marquis de Lafayette, whose legacy uh, inspired the creation of this project this evening. I hope the rules are clear for everybody. It's time now to welcome our teams. They prepared themselves, they trained very hard for this evening, arguing for the motion. Welcome to Vanina Meyer, Nicole Regnon, and Sata Croy. These three constitute the proposition team. Please take your seat. And on the other hand, arguing against the motion, the opposition side welcome Ryan Mitra, Niveti Tamanta, Clara Danbakil, and Zenli. Please take your seat. <laughs> to encourage you for this match. I know, Carl, do we start the debate just now? Okay. So I now call the first proposition speaker. You will have eight minutes. It's you. You will have eight minutes maximum to deliver the opening speech for the proposition group. Uh, Vanina, we are ready to listen to you. Chairperson, members of the jury, ladies and gentlemen, do you remember 2019, our last year of normalcy? We were carefree. We could gather without restrictions. Masks were only used by medical staff and superheroes. Travel was an escape. Culture was accessible. Professors, how is it to teach in front of black screens? Students, how do you feel to have your computer as best friend? The audience, don't you want to be seated here in front of us rather than watching us virtually? Don't you miss your old life? We live in unprecedented times. There is a life before COVID-19 and a life after that no one expected. 
Words like mask, jail, social distancing, lockdowns, quarantine are now part of our common vocabulary. We all need our normal life back. And as the government, we propose the motion the state should make, COVID, make vaccination against COVID-19 a legal requirement for its residents. The problem is simple. The longer we wait, the more people will die. For example, in India, during the second wave, nearly two people died every minute. The burden of the debate for the government side is to prove the imperative need to make vaccination a legal requirement because it's the best public health measure possible. Our first three arguments will be necessity, effectiveness, and why mandatory vaccination is justified. Then our deputy prime minister will present the state's responsibility to prevent cross-border harm and how it best protects individual rights. Our policy will make COVID-19 vaccines legally binding for all its residents, including citizens and non-citizens within a state. By a state, we mean a democratic country with enough vaccine supplies, with sufficient infrastructures and logistics to provide universal, equitable and access for all. Pursuant to international law norms, vaccination will not be forcibly administrated. The duty to get vaccinated is enforced indirectly through penalties or costs, including withholdings of benefits like no jab, no play in Australia. The, those non-compliant costs fall within the protective responsibility and positive obligation of the state to take appropriate measures to protect the life and health of those within their jurisdiction. If residents are not vaccinated, work from home will become a requirement. Discretionary activities will be restricted as well as travel outside the country. To provide free and equal access for every residence, vaccination center will be implemented everywhere in the country. If you can come to the vaccine, the vaccine will come to you. About vaccine hesitancy and skepticism, COVID-19 vaccine have to comply with the same requirements as for any other vaccine and are not lowered in the context of the pandemic. An awareness campaign will be implemented. I will take you upon afterwards, thank you. And now you will ask yourself, why? Why is it necessary? A virus stopped the world from living for more than a year now. And we've seen the gravity of the situation. More than 3 million people have died so far. Our economies are paralyzed. We feel isolated as never before. Think about your family, your friends, who lost their jobs, who had to shut down their businesses because of COVID-19. The economy needs to get back on track. We need to support restaurants, bars, art galleries, shops, theaters to reestablish their economy faster because they're drowning. 81 million. 81 million is the number of persons outside the labor force in, 2000, in 2020, according to the ILO. It's more than the size of the population of France and Switzerland combined. Those unprecedented health, economic, and well-being consequences show the necessity and the urgency to make COVID-19 vaccine a legal requirement. Let's move on now to the effectiveness part. COVID-19 vaccines is effective in reducing community spread and preventing disease. The latest data from WHO and other research show that Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna coronavirus vaccines are around 94% effective at preventing and stopping the transmission against COVID-19 and its variants. And now I will ask a question. Do you know what is the most effective way to get back to our normal lives? It's to reach herd immunity. And what is herd immunity? It's when around more than 80% of a population is vaccinated, according to Johns Hopkins Hospital data. The spread of disease from person to person is unlikely, and therefore the community is protected, like children or those who cannot protect themselves. Therefore, we must think as a collective. I will take your point. Um, you spoke about indirect sanctions and penalty. Can you identify exactly which penalty you're speaking of? Thank you for this question. So your question pertains to a point of our policy. So the penalties could be like uh, withholdings of benefits, like we've seen in Australia with no job, no play. It means that uh, parents who don't want to put their children into school will have three payments that they will not be able to benefit from. So these will be those uh, type of, of uh, withholdings of benefits. And now I will ask 
you why our motion is justified. Vaccination as a legal requirement is justified to prevent the threat of harms to others. In the comfort of your home, you want to individually decide for yourself. But do you think about the consequences and the harmful impact it can have on others? Are you aware of the collective duty of easy rescue? It's when the cost of an act to individual is small, but when the benefit of everyone doing that same act is large, there is a collective benefit. And here it's the case with mandatory vaccination. There is a crucial urgency to reduce this highly contagious threat. That's COVID-19. I would like to conclude my speech with this thought. Take a moment to think about the people who got COVID-19. Some of them were lucky enough to only have minor symptoms, but so many others lost taste, smell, suffocated, or the others even ended up at the hospital, and so many never got out. This disease is scary, unpredictable, and very dangerous. We are here on the same side, the side of health and life. Ladies and gentlemen, chairperson, members of the jury, we demonstrated how our policy is necessary, effective, and justified. Time is life. Have faith in our policy, because faith is the bird that feels the light when the dawn is still dark. Thank you. Bravo. Merci, Vanina, pour ce solide argumentaire. I now call for the first speaker for the opposition group to respond to that we have just here now. It's up to you, Ryan, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Good evening to everyone present here and online. Quite a moving speech from my colleague on the other side. But the line of argumentation from side proposition is um, like a donut. Simple, inviting, finished product, a solution, but much like a donut, there's a large gaping hole right in the middle of it. We need to understand that any cure and any solution also has certain knock-on effects. And in light of that, our basis, on, basis of argumentation is based on the philosophy of the pharmacon. The pharmacon basically consists of a cure of a solution and a scapegoat or a harm. The poison here, obviously, is COVID. The proposed solution here is the legal mandate of a COVID-19 vaccine, and we say that the harms associated with that solution far outweigh the minimal gains to be gained from it. Now, we accept all the definitions given by side proposition. The, we accept the burden of proof established by side proposition. Now, the burden of proof on side proposition is, why do vaccines as they exist in status quo need to be elevated to a legal mandate? Now, side opposition has two lines of argumentation. First is bodily autonomy and agency, which I will be handling. And the second is effectiveness, which Nivedita will be handling. My two, my two constructs deal with bodily autonomy and the voluntary participation of residents. On a six minute, ma'am. The first construct, I will identify three harms. The first is bodily autonomy and its association with expression and faith. The second is the exaggerated distrust that will be established between the state and the people. And the third is that any form of penalty will be ineffective at the end of the day. Now, the right to bodily autonomy side proposition will say is not absolute, and we accept that. But at the same time, it is a protected right. And all through legal discourse, it is established that if that right is to be overridden, the harm upon society needs to be overwhelmingly abominable. And we state that harm is a lived experience already, and the harm that they are trying to solve is already being solved in status quo. Now, in, re in regards to the first harm that we're talking about, right from the beginning, we like to establish it is advisable everybody get vaccinated. Vaccines are good. Vaccines are not bad but compulsory vaccines are. The first harm, we need to understand that vaccines have a social value. The way vaccines are introduced in society, there is a perception deficit that occurs. An Amish person, for example, will perceive the vaccine differently compared to an atheist person. Now we need to understand when the state forcefully puts the vaccine, even through indirect sanctions, through the skin of an Amish person, the fundamental understanding of this person 
changes without his consent. Now, we need to understand that in the right to violate this body, in the, in the attempt to violate this bodily right, it is also coupled with the right to faith and expression. And that needs to be configured in the conversation that they, are, they have not spoken of so far. Which brings me to my second harm in regards to significant distrust. It is important and imperative to remove the veil of presentism that side proposition is placing on this issue. This is not unprecedented. And it, is, it has been part of historical discourse all the way dating back to 1853 to England's Vac National Vaccination Act. Now, side proposition says that there'll be greater vaccination rates if this mandate is given. But they've provided no scientific six minute, ma'am, they have provided no evidence that that will actually happen. There is no scientific, six minute ma'am, scientific, academic, or practical experience that shows that a forceful mandate leads to a significantly higher vaccinations. But all through history, it has seen that whenever such a mandate has been proposed, it has been met with significant social dissent, erosion of public faith, and significant exaggerated uh, deficits between trust of, between the state and the people. And that is the second harm. Now the third harm. Now the myopic stance of this of side proposition simply assumes that making it legal mandate means that everybody will just hurry and want to exercise the civil liberties in in the in the right to do so. We need to understand that just because you introduce that mandate doesn't mean there's going to be 100% compliance. And that is the very virtue of its existence of law. The fact that when a law is introduced by its very existence it creates outliers, transgressors and violators. Now let me paint your picture. I miss concerts, and I assume everybody here does so, and I hope that Sai Proposition agrees with this. Their packaging will basically say that if you get vaccinated, you can go to a concert and access other civil liberties. Positive affirmation, brilliant. But what happens when somebody who's not vaccinated shows up to the concert? What happens when somebody is exercising the civil liberties as I spoke in the interest of, their, of deterring the harms previously spoken of? What happens then? Would you criminalize them and put them in jails disproportionately? Or would you simply say that we will, we will say the penalty is regards to economic benefits, which not everybody exercise and a certain group of people only exercise from the state, which in itself is not only discriminatory, but also goes on to show that somebody who's not dependent on the state in regards to that penalty will simply be flouting that law as per he or she wishes. Which brings me to my second construct in regards to voluntary participation. We need to understand that when COVID measures were introduced, actually, before I move on to my second question, I'll take a question. Yes. There have been overwhelming deaths all across the society at large. Yes. How can you say that vaccines would not be the answer to it? Uh, I write in my speech say, say that vaccines are the answer to it. I'm saying that compulsory vaccines are. And thank you for that question, because that leads perfectly into my ne co next construct in regards to voluntary participation. We need to understand that when we're talking about COVID vaccines, it, uh, COVID, it is a lived reality for everybody, right? When COVID mandatory re regulations were established in regards to face, mask, social distancing, we need to understand that that was obviously in the interest of reducing transmission, but also the interest of reducing the burden of hospitals. At no point were hospitals ineffective to treat COVID, but because of the sheer number of bodies coming through their doors, they were severely overburdened. And the resource crunch led to the extremely harrowing pictures that side proposition is painting. Now, we need to understand that voluntary participation in itself has already reduced severe burdens in places where the supply exists. And as they have established the state we are in, the supply exists. Now, let me give you some statistics from, from the real world. The day, the, the day India opened up registrations for COVID-19 vaccines, 13.62 million people registered for that vaccine. In the United Kingdom, 37 million people have at least gotten the first dose by July 20, by July 27 million would have gotten the double dose. That's 40%. And there are still, there will still be people in line to get the first dose. In Seychelles, 61.4% people are already vaccinated, per capita highest. The United States, 150,000 people have already received the double dose vaccine. In India and the United States, on a daily basis, the system continues to crash because people want that vaccine. Now, in the case of Seychelles, it is proven that you can still get COVID-19 in spite of getting the vaccine. So herd immunity is a long way uh, scientifically proven to be achieved from the current, current vaccine trends that we have. But what is proven is that just because you have the vaccine, that means that you have reduced the burden on the hospitals. You do not require hospitalizations. So therefore, hospitals can laterally address anybody who hasn't gotten the vaccine over time. Now, I'd like to summarize my arguments. 
First, I've told you that bodily autonomy has three harms. Bodily autonomies will incur three harms associated with their legal mandate. First, expression and bodily autonomy. Second is in regards to the, the distrust between the state and the people. And the third is in regards to ineffective penalty. And lastly, I've told you how voluntary participation has already allowed to elevate a situation that they so gravely are painting. I'm proud to oppose. Thank you so much. Okay, I am. Thank you very much. So we can see already the strong controversy between you. Uh, I will call now the, the speaker for the second round. I now call the second proposition speaker, Nicole Setavou. It's confusing how opposition is okay with masks, restrictions in movement, and lockdowns, but at the same time assert that bodily autonomy and freedoms are very absolute. Conflicting. For opposition to win this debate, they must first decide what they want to defend to begin with. They failed to engage my first speaker when she said that it's within state's power and responsibility that it does what is necessary and proportionate for a legitimate aim. COVID is unlike anything in recent history. It is cross-cutting, trans-boundary, and highly uncertain, massive damages simultaneously happening and destabilizing big and small economies, strong and weak states. With the existence of our very, when the existence of our very future is in question, the government needs to reconsider self-preservation, as it is with wars. We saw this when Massachusetts required vaccinations in 1902 for smallpox outbreak, or today, when schools require influenza vaccination for children. Smallpox and influenza are vaccine success stories. The principle is the same. It's just that we adjust it to who is likely to spread the virus. This speech is first going to rebut, argue, then summarize. Rebuttals. He argued about bodily autonomy, how the perception of an Amish changes if we suddenly um, require vaccination. Our question is, so what? We think that number one, the harm is so grave that it's within state's power to implement this. But second, should it change? It changes towards science and it changes towards bias, towards scientific um, evidence and the need to actually believe that um, uh, the cures are going to happen. We think then, then it's we think then that it's okay for them to change their perception because the effects would be um, applicable even outside COVID vaccination and all other vaccinations that could happen in status quo. Second, he talked about distrust, but we think that we'd rather have citizens who are alive, even if they're pissed, than citizens who are happy but dead. We think that distrust, a uh, uh, mistrust, could be rebuilt later on. Uh, by the state. But furthermore, we think that the best way to um, solve narratives of distrust is through grounding it on rational solutions, science-based rational solutions that are going to be consistent at the end of the day. We think furthermore that uh, the, the question on policy, on whether or not it's going to be effective, is, has no position. Because we think that yes, vaccinated, uh, a vaccinated person who appears in a concert will be penalized as it is with any other law, right? So we think that number one, he fails to engage Vanina's, um, Vanina's, uh, Vanina's policy when she said that there's going to be strong implementation. But second, we're okay to go that far. We think further that there is a need for it because when you look at the statistics, only 60% of the adults who are not yet vaccinated are willing to take uh, the vaccine later on. That's not enough to reach herd immunity. And yes, Seychelles is happening. But when you look at Seychelles, the problem with that is they open the economy too fast because it's a tourism-heavy industry, right? But if you look at the statistics even further, the vaccine did get, do its job. It uh, lowers the number of deaths among those who are already vaccinated. It low in the number of extreme cases. But he never engaged other examples like Israel, Indonesia, or even Taiwan, who um, opened their borders without strong, aggressive vaccination policies, and now are seeing a, a, an increase, a, a spike in the number of cases. Now let's move on to my rebuttals. 
First, I'd like to argue on how we best protect individual rights. I would concede with opposition that individual rights are critical to our being. But in status quo, we don't see the full expression of those individual rights anyway. You have the right to bodily autonomy, but you have to wear masks. You have a right to freedom of assembly, but you'd always feel scared to be part of that protest. You have a right to religion, but mosques, churches, and synagogues are closed. You have a right to movement, but where will you go if everything is closed? You have a right to family, um, to family right and unity, but even family who are in the same country cannot meet with each other. We think that you have rights, but they are deemed useless in status quo. We think that the dichotomy between individual rights and um, uh, collective effort is actually imaginary. In fact, we'd agree that they would reinforce each other. But the situation uh, at, the, at the moment changes that type of uh, dynamics so much so that we first have to secure collective interests before we get to protect individual rights. What does our policy do? We feel like uh, what the policy does, it, is, it hastens the process of getting herd immunity. It hastens the, um, the process of reclaiming those rights. And this is where I'd like to clarify. When my first speaker said individuals who cannot protect themselves, these are kids, pregnant women, highly immunocompromised individuals who do not qualify to take the vaccines. They never had a choice. So the only way to protect them is to build herd immunity that the government side uh, recognized as the vulnerable right and before I move so the conclusion of this argument is very simple we think that uh, first of all we need to uh, secure the right to life because it's an enabling right and that's the only way you could access all other rights that they are trying to say but then second of all we think that this is a, this the policy is how you actually reclaim your rights to its full expression point uh, Ma'am, considering the examples you just stated and voluntary participation being a big factor in that, can you give any evidence that a mandatory vaccine leads to significantly higher vaccine rates than already seen through voluntary participation? Well, when you look at it, it's very instinctive, right? At the worst case, that individuals are willing to take the vaccine, then it would be a non-issue. Our policy would be accepted with so much trust and acceptance from the people, right? The, 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 the reason why the government has to actually require it is because there are people who are resisting it, right? So there are people who, who would have been, um, who, would have, uh, who wouldn't want to participate in it. So in the best case, it's okay, right? They're gonna accept it uh, willingly and openly as they would have. And the conflict of opposition of mistrust, etc., would not have accrued if it is true that people don't resist. Second argument is about how the state has a responsibility to control transboundary harm. The state has a commitment to international community to control spread of harms outside its border, often the principle behind environmental issues such as pollution. Health governance has since prioritized coordinated evidence-based management, which is why we have the WHO and the COVAX. The virus does not see political uh, borders, and our best strategy forward is coordinated action. It takes 80% to build the benefit of herd immunity, but it only takes one to cause the harm. By harm of one, I mean spread. Each country has a case one. Remember that everything is tracked back to that one market in Wuhan. Harm of one, I mean variants, existing UK, South Africa variants that vary in strengths of transmissibility and lethality. We cannot perfectly predict when and how this will happen, so the responsibility of the state is to err in the side of caution. It's a numbers game. If the state should limit who could spread the virus and be the host for the next big variant, right? So in the best case, the virus ends and there is no uh, mutation. But in the worst case, at least we solve existing strains and second, uh, the second, we buy time for the pharmaceutical company. In summary, I highlighted opposition's inconsistencies in values, and all those problems are mitigable. I reinforced per first speaker argument on state responsibility by arguing in my speech how this responsibility extends to the rest of the world. Nicole. And lastly, I showed that opposition's strongest value of individual rights is best achieved in our side. Thank you. Thank you, you. Eight minutes, exactly. So now we will call the next speaker for the opposition group. And I think it's up to Nivetida. Welcome. You can speak.
We all want to wish this pandemic away, but states have a responsibility to be the moral center for its citizens as we find a way to fight this pandemic. In my speech, I'm going to make two arguments. First, on the idea of vaccine hesitancy and how can we most effectively address this. And second, on the idea of where can we find sustainable solutions um, to collective action problems that we are going to face again and again as states. Before that, certain point of rebuttals, right? We think side proposition in all its like um, care for its citizens, etc., paints a very unrealistic picture. They say that supply exists when talking about India. That's just shameful. Second, they say that they'll set up vaccination centers everywhere. You won't have to go to the vaccine. The vaccine will come to you. This isn't status quo in most places. They'll roll out educational programs to handle skepticism and all of this. We don't understand if all of this can happen, which isn't in, st in status quo, what is the benefit of ensuring that a law exists in the first place? All this, when they continue to harp upon these penalties being something that people can take up, these aren't going to be that no play, no jab is, is about children not being able to go to school, which is a sting that um, adults are less likely to feel. People that have already been working from home for a year, who anyway exercise the kind of self-control where if they see they're going to attend mass gatherings where people are less likely to wear masks, they stop themselves, where they don't attend, or, like don't go, don't go to the office because they know that there are going to be people that are not going to be vaccinated, etc. We think adults are more competent than children and ma are making these decisions already, right? And they have, they seem to have no faith in their citizens to be able to make a lot of these decisions. But more importantly, on the idea of uh, why vaccine hesitancy exists, they brush this away by saying that educational campaigns can handle this. We think it isn't true, right? We think a lot of concerns that people have about vaccines are to some extent legitimate and they are reasonable. People seem don't, don't seem to understand how these vaccines were developed too quickly. They don't understand the experimental nature of these vaccines. They further don't know if, the, if there are long-term effects that science has not yet tested or that there are impacts that they aren't aware of on their own personal bodies. This is where individual liberties and my ability to rationalize that if I take this trade-off of these small risks, these perceived small risks for the benefit of society needs to be rationalized to an individual. We think that is, it is at this moment that we must hold states accountable, right? Because states were quick to use taxpayer money to get vaccines, to develop them, to procure them. But we don't think they put enough might in ensuring ensuring that people know that mRNA technology has been in the works for decades, that people recognize that a lot of work to develop the COVID-19 vaccine is built on knowledge about coronaviruses in the past, right? All of this is information that the public, that was absent from public discourse. And we think if both of these are premises that you're likely to buy, then it is reasonable for people to want to tell their states that we need time, that we need the right to refuse this vaccine while we make our decisions, right? And therefore, we think, like, Proposition can't just wash this away by saying educational campaigns are going to do it. They, are, they, they might, but they have to be much more effective than just passing a law, right? Um, and that's uh, where we think um, if people don't have access to credible information about vaccine safety, if, if they don't have access to a healthcare provider, or it actually costs them their daily wage, right? Because currently, the efficient, the efficient um, rollout system, which is also their policy, their policy, like uh, the idea that we should make this a law, is in the same breath of let's try and get as many people vaccinated and we don't care about their concerns, we don't want to listen to anybody's rational or irrational fears, but let's get the job done. This has led to the use of technology in sign-up sheets, right? And we know that this falls right across the same fault lines of in inequitable access to so many barriers that people currently face in status quo. We think, however great the end goal may be, the means cannot sacrifice equity, and personal harms accrue disproportionately, disproportionately to people that are limited by their environment isn't something that side opposition supports. But on the larger idea, actually, yeah, go. Are you willing to wait for every single individual to change their mind, even with the risk of mutation, and even with the risk of spread? 
Um, on the idea of mutation, right, we actually don't know how effective these vaccines are against to the many new variants that exist in India. We will concede that vaccinating more people is less likely to lead to more variants, and we understand that. Side opposition does not have to defend getting every last person on board. We also, we just need to defend the idea that there is a lot more that the states can do while ensuring that the harms to personal autonomy, the harms to individual freedoms is one that we don't trade away in, a, in, a, in such a lax way, right? And this leads me to what I think is like the, is, is the calculus that most states should apply, right? Today's debate, it informs a larger conversation about sustainable policies. We think if it is a state's responsibility to come up with policies that are efficient and effective, it is also its responsibility to make sure that its polity feels empowered. We think policies that act, don't act for this, um, or act to their detriment are one that we do not want to support. And this is engaging on their idea that people aren't thinking about others, right? We think that if, uh, when we look at the success of the voluntary rollout system, right, uh, of, of vaccination, it reveals that people are intrinsically motivated. This intrinsic motivation of a moral obligation or a duty interacts with the state's policies. So if a state is likely to indulge in a legal mandate um, where it circumvents any moral deliberation, which is likely to happen in a voluntary system. In a voluntary system, you're going to have citizens that now look at this as a fight that they have to do as part of a team, not one that the government now, a government that distrusts them, that doesn't understand their concerns, but continues to shame them in, um, uh, and frame this debate as one between science versus ignorance and you know, trying to rationalize, never rationalize uh, any legitimate or reasonable fears that these people might have. We think individuals interact with the information that they have access to, which governments have unable to do so, which governments have been unable to provide. We think they seek advice from healthcare workers, and that should be where we disseminate information from. We tend to make this politi uh, politicized way more than it needs to be, right? We continue to uh, ensure that governors or mayors and you know political figures talk to communities when we know that there are, uh, there are uh, polarizations um, uh, in the messengers that give this uh, key. We think as states have huge collective action problems ahead of them, COVID-19, climate change, etc., they need to signal to their residents that they trust them. Policies that address people's concerns of access, health, reflect a government that wants to equip its people for fighting the good fight. This helps the vaccine hesitancy as well, because at some level, we do recognize that people need to take a leap of faith, but they're likely to do it if they know that they're fighting on the same team and are contributing to the good fight. In conclusion, on opposition, we believe that states need to look closely at their distribution policies, to not be quick to frame this debate as one of science versus ignorance, but rather listen to and address equity concerns. We think there's a lot that, gov uh, that uh, proposition claims in the first half of of their speech that can do the job and by their own like by their own volition re, uh, removes the need for a legal mandate and the coercive nature of it given the harms that we've told you the harms of protecting personal autonomy repairing our healthcare systems and empowering our residents to do good and be moral in a fight against the pathogen therefore proud to oppose okay so bravo we have now reached uh, the middle of this debate. Uh, we already have both sides very strong arguments. Now it's uh, up to you, Satak, the third speaker of the proposition group. Good evening, Madam President, members of the jury, distinguished audience members present here, as well as online. I begin my speech with deep humility and respect and with an unequivocal and unstinting recognition that we stand here during unprecedented times. Ladies and gentlemen, Martin Luther King had bestowed upon us a searching call to action, and I quote, life's most pressing and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? In the course of my next few minutes, apart from dismantling the opposition's case presented so far, I will be showcasing as to why the side governments comprehensive policy proposal would make the Martin Luther King proud in the heavens. Ladies and gentlemen, my speech is divided into two simple parts. First, I will identify the core clashes in this debate, and secondly, I'll be summarizing the comprehensive policy proposal that my Madam uh, Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Minister presented before you all. What was the two core clashes of this debate? 
as can already be seen from uh, the proceedings so far, the first clash is relating to collective good, collective uh, security, and public health at large, vis-a-vis -vis isolated, rare instances of individual objections. I will first deal with this uh, uh, clash and then proceed on to the issue reg regarding the change of status quo, which the government, side government suggests, while the side opposition uh, goes against it. Now, as, as we can see, the reason why the collective good and collective uh, need is required can also be seen from the fact that numbers, numbers speak larger than isolated instances. And before I go into the number game that the side opposition wanted to portray to all of us, let me remind to everyone by borrowing a small phrase from the Rolling Stones, in a democracy, you can't get always what you want. Therefore, it is the great compromise of citizens that is represented through a political mandate. A compromise that states, we disagree in principle, yet we agree to respect your opinion and be governed by it. In a democratic state as like ours, what we have witnessed around the world, that there have been more than 3.5 million deaths happening, 81 million people out of the labor force. So it is imperative that the collective good is upheld. And how, does, how do we suggest this? As my uh, Deputy Prime Minister suggested and hinted at, a uh, plethora of case laws, landmark case laws, for example, what she mentioned, the Jacobson versus Massachusetts, at the European Court of Human Rights in Solomkin versus uh, Ukraine, and several other cases, the, in, the individual rights have been stated to be qualified rights because the larger public interest far outweighs the same. Let me give a very s simple scenario, a story about Typhoid Mary. It was stated that in the US, Typhoid Mary had gone around spreading typhoid and did not want to get vaccinated against it. And therefore, that person was forcibly taken into, taken into vaccination center and put, put, into, and put through for a vaccination uh, program. So the, in, in the collective, what we also try to recognize, as my side Deputy Prime Minister stated, for many people who cannot get vaccinated, for example, pregnant women or many other people who are immunocompromised, the side opposition has forgotten Mahatma Gandhi's great words of talisman. When he had mentioned, when you take a step forward, think about the poorest and the weakest. In our side government's proposal, the vaccine for all program, for all residents, will not be politicized. And that is the best part of this, of this process. Secondly, we also suggest, as my Deputy Prime Minister mentioned, that as a responsible state in the international forum, we will ensure that cross-border transboundary harms are also prevented through this collective, uh, collective conscience for mankind that we want to endorse in our model. In the case of individual, uh, individual uh, rights that they were talking about, as they have already conceded, right to private life or right to religious freedoms are qualified rights. However, in our model, what we uphold the most, we uphold right to life with dignity. We uphold right to freedom of movement. We uphold right of assembly, which also leads to freedom of expression at large. And therefore, their side or the side opposition's arguments about lockdowns and mass are curtailment of further individual rights, which we want to do away with. Therefore, this leads to the point that why there is a need or a change for a change of status quo at large. First, the need per, per, uh, exists from the fact that the status quo is, needs to be changed because in our motion, we give full expression to both collective rights as well as individual rights. Whereas in their model, and they quoted the case of India, which is now right now under lockdown while people are dying and they are saying that vaccines could be made voluntary. However, on the contrary, we say that if vaccines are made a legal mandate and it's made legally required for everyone, in a few months time, as can be seen from many countries, people can congregate together, attend concerts and also visit museums and other places. This, therefore, we showcase that in both the court clashes, the side government overwhelmingly wins the debate, not just on ethics, but also on the legal uh, aspects as well. This leads me towards summarizing the side government's proposition so far. And as everyone can be present here, everyone's a domain area expert. And first, so the propositions that was put forth by side government consists of six primary grounds. And I will summarize the same. Firstly, 
Yes, I, I will take a question first, yes. Uh, so considering an infinite bank of out-of-context quotes regarding Gandhi and poverty, won't the penalty proposed by PM discriminate against people who are dependent on economic benefits versus who, who aren't? So as the side government has already showcased, the vaccine is available for all, and it will be covering each and every individual, and we will not leave anyone out from the same. And our social benefit program would also be given to them for who are taking the vaccine. So therefore, to summarize my arguments from the side uh, proposition, First, for everyone, we suggest that there, for everyone present here would agree that there is a great overwhelming threat to public health with more than 3.5 million deaths and 81 million people out of the labor force. For all the medical practitioners here, they would agree that the vaccine is safe and once the vaccine is safe and effective and has undergone three phases of the trial, which the side, Madam Prime Minister has already stated, it, is to be, it can be administered to everyone. Third, for all the ethicists amongst us, they would agree that the mandatory vaccination has a superior cost-benefit profile compared to all other alternatives, and this can be witnessed from various historical trends leading up to herd immunity. Fourth, all the legal mandarins amongst us, they would, they would agree that the implementation of the policy is a necessary and proportionate measure to the urgency of the situation and, and pursues a legitimate aim. Fifth, for all the social scientists that we have, as a direct outcome from our policy, people would be able to reclaim their rights better. And sixth, and most importantly, at the gra Graduate Institute, at, the gra at International Geneva, all the internationalists would, would agree that by preventing cross-border harms, this policy would ensure that the state lives up to its international obligations. And let me conclude by suggesting what Andrew Fagan had once suggested, that the cornerstone of human rights is understanding the concerns of those suffering. Thank you very much. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Satak. Et maintenant, j'appelle uh, Clara uh, du team uh, proposition, proposition team. Uh, it's up to you, Clara. Dear member of the opposition, dear member of the proposition, and dear member of the jury. Before deepening the arguments that my colleagues introduced earlier, I would like to first answer to my proposition colleague, uh, comment. He's saying that the state is offering a compromise with the population, but I don't see any compromise here by imposing a mandate to don't let the choice to the citizens, or otherwise, if they don't want to comply with the idea of the law, they will have to be in-house arrest. And secondly, also talking about mask, and that mask is as restrict restrictive as vaccine. Well, we're not agreeing on this. Why? Because first, there's the aspect of irreversibility. The mask is something that we can always remove, while the uh, vaccine is an injection inside the body. Plus, the intimacy is not the same. The mask is something which is outside the body, while the vaccine is something that penetrates inside your body, which is really different. And uh, my first point is that also there is way more, way more hesitancy on the vaccine than for the, max, for the mask. Why? Because it's two different things. So to come back to my speech, I would like to focus myself on the main clash points of the debate that my colleague addressed in the best manner. Uh, the first clash point is that the proposition believe that a mandate will benefit the society in the best ways by ending the pandemic. However, my colleague explains how restricting individual liberty by mandating vaccination in this context would be ethically and socially inappropriate. So first, we argue that the consequence of the ma mandate or loss of social cohesion and trust in the scientific com community, and that those consequences would outweigh the benefit of reduced viral spread. And what will happen if you force people to get vaccinated with a vaccine they perceive to be dangerous? That will likely affect trust in public institution, institutions and trust in vaccination, including the scientific uh, community. So by making vaccine compulsory, you also add a layer of discrimination against those who choose not to be vaccinated by not being allowed to travel or not being employed because of a house arrest. So this motion makes people feel like outlaws. And their precautionary approach is totally understandable, like my colleague Nivedita expressed earlier, considering the experimental nature of the current vaccine. And it would be totally unethical to disregard the concern of this group, especially as they are not altogether unreasonable. The state, by making this vaccine compulsory, don't take the time to try to convince its own population about the benefits of the vaccine. 
Then another clash point was that the proposition believed that coercion is the best solution and that breaking the trust of the population toward the government is not that a big deal. Well, to answer this, I will cite the World Health Organization, who insisted that making vaccine mandatory would be the wrong road to take, adding that there were examples in the past when mandating vaccines backfired with greater opposition to them. So you can't assume that if you apply a mandate, people will directly accept it. And especially in the age of mass media, where compulsory vaccination is likely to be a flashpoint like mass mandates before. But unlike the mass mandate, compulsory vaccinations threatened a fund fundamental liberty interest and is likely to encounter even fiercer resistance. So the reality is that applicable mandates need some buy-in and some compliance to work well. Because tomorrow, let's say another crisis may emerge. It can be a pandemic or something else. And by answering to the specific crisis by discursive manner, you normalize the kind of legal coercive tools and open path to authoritarian measures. But the risk here is that the trust between the state and the citizens in the long term may get damaged severely. And even later on, we may even worry that the state will begin to implement measures like this when there is no crisis at all, or where it fails to appropriately circumscribe the limits of what constitutes a crisis. I will take your point. Where will inequality happen if everyone will be able to travel because everyone is vaccinated? Are you OK with individual rights that are half-hearted? Uh, can you repeat the question, please? Where will inequality happen if everyone can travel? And um, are you okay with half-hearted individual rights? I think that the problem of the government is that they don't put themselves in the shoes of a part of a population, which is a consequent part of the population. I think they don't understand what a hesitant is. A hesitant person is someone who is truly fear about this vaccine or about the side effects of the vaccine. And we're not talking about anti-vax and conspirationists who think that the vaccine will inject a Bill Gates microchip into our body. We're talking about people who think that the vaccine was too premature and we think that's going to engender uh, real side effects. And they're afraid about their own health. And by making this mandate, you ask them to choose about their own belief and about their own health and their own liberty. And that's why it's criminalizing them at the same time. So to come back to uh, another flashpoint uh, is that uh, we believe that a mandate is not necessary and that we should focus on the health structure and the access to the health care, like my uh, colleague Nivedita explained earlier. We need to understand that the current access to health system is discriminatory. And we can take the example on rural areas where health infrastructures are lacking. So more we improve the access to healthcare system, more we are going to get vaccinated people and closer to achieve the herd immunity. But I guess the government do not even mind answering this question since they prefer spending their money to enforce that mandate rather than actually improve the access to healthcare system. So finally, through the debate, the proposition said that a voluntarily basis vaccine is not enough and we should implement the mandate. While well, the opposition believe that is not the case and that this voluntary basis should be combined with a public health message. So let's, first, let's start with the public health message. The opposition believe that persuasion is better than coercion. And by that, I mean that implementing a broad vaccine mandate, uh, before that, the government would be wise to consider the most common reasons for vaccine refusal and work to address those concerns. The state have a responsibility to educate its own citizens on issues relevant to the public. Now let's uh, talk about the voluntary participations. So the opposition believe it's the best solution. First, a majority of people will want to voluntarily take the vaccine, which is already a great news for removing the pressure on the hospitals and therefore reducing the number of deaths, like my colleague Ryan explained earlier. And regarding the hesitance, when they will see that most people who have taken the vaccine and that the spread of the virus will indeed decrease without substantive side effects, they will realize that, well, this vaccine is not dangerous and will be more willing to take it. So little by little, the fear regarding the vaccine will disappear and the vaccination campaign will work by itself. And in the meanwhile, people who don't want to get vaccinated will be able to go outside, but we have to wear a mask and respect distances. But we choose to not criminalize them. So with those two combined measures, we'll be able to first slow down significantly the spread of the virus 
And secondly, building the trust between the government and the population by giving to the people the freedom of agency, the freedom of faith, and the freedom of body autonomy. And this is how a proper democratic government should cope with a sanitary crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Clara, very much. Now uh, we will have um, the last two speeches. The last two speeches uh, will uh, last uh, f four minutes only. I now call um, to start the last speaker of team opposition. And it's then, it's up to you. Uh, good evening. Please. Uh, what a passionate debate this has been. But let me summarize, and I think we can come to an agreement But why government is wrong. <laughs> what is at stake here is not the importance of vaccination. So much must be said about the benefits of medical prevention. What is at stake here, and the burden of proof of government, is to show that a legal mandate will enable the government to administer the vaccination in an effective manner for society and for individual. This is the objective of the motion. And it only boils down to two things why the government completely failed to show a legal mandate is necessary. Number one, as we have shown, the current voluntary scheme with awareness campaign is much more effective. To put it simply, a legal and secondly, to put it very simply, a legal mandate just doesn't work because of the risk of coercion leading to trust deficit. So let me put it the first. As we have ardently shown, the voluntary participation has been hugely successful because many people have lived experience of what COVID was, and this drives them to get the vaccination. And with the right incentive and campaign, it will continue to be the best way forward to ensure the effectiveness of administrating this vaccine. The government points to vaccine hesitation. A bigger concern, we think, for the government is rather to put a greater effort in addressing the lack of accessibility to information campaign and to vaccination centres. Do that first. Trust and empower your people and see how the vaccine hesitation rate will be significantly reduced and your objective will be achieved. The government quote Israel. I wonder why. It has one of the highest vaccination rate in the world and it does so through successful vaccination campaigns. Given its fortunate circumstances in Israel with having abundance of supply of vaccination, their message was simple. It's one of, of, about privilege. It says, take advantage of the opportunity that so many countries now are currently struggling with. This leads me to my second point. And as it currently stands, a legal mandate can actually make things worse. I'll explain why. You know, the government said, I would rather have the citizen being distrust rather than being dead. Wow. Uh, and it says, the mandatory vaccination should not be politicized. Yes, we don't want people to die. And yes, we are all for the benefits of vaccination. But here's what you need to understand. For that, particularly for vaccination for COVID-19. Making vaccine a mandate without giving time and doing so in a vacuum without cons consent with the society, it sparks as a government who doesn't trust its society. And the repercussion, especially the repercussion of the risk of coercion, is a massive disobedience from society, rendering the administration of the vaccine much more difficult. It's also a complete disrespect for personal expression faith, and even those who have been misinformed or lack the access to be informed. Therefore, without proper education campaign, distribution reforms, and worse still, with a blank state mandate, it creates a huge trust deficit between the government and the public. How would you run the country then? To administer a vaccine effectively, the real issue here, the key issue here, and I emphasize, it's about the communication and trust building activities. So we can empower our citizens with their own agency to make that choice. We will prevail against COVID-19 with the current voluntary scheme, a, dis a better distributing reform, and with awareness campaign. If we want to administer vaccine in the most effective way, in a manner that demands respect, and even prove aspirational for many of these countries who will soon face this question, should it be mandated? And as we have shown very, very strongly, the administration of vaccination must not be legalized. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zen. Thank you, Zen. So, we have, we will have now the last speech of the debate. 
to convince the audience and the jury uh, your team was the best tonight. So uh, we, it's against uh, up to you, and Sadak, please. These are few moments of silence for the manner in which the opposition ran a dagger through the heart of human conscience. They want to be the Nero's fiddling while Rome is burning. So what has happened so far in this debate? The side government has showcased pictures, image, imageries of people dying, of people out of labor forces, while the side government is busy reiterating that the status quo is fine while people continue to die. So what do they paint before us? They suggest that it is OK that we continue with voluntary vaccinations without being cognizant of when and where, at what time we reach herd immunity. They portray pictures of individual cases, circumstances, which they suggest is against individual rights. Let me remind everyone over here, nothing, nothing in this world is without terrible obstacles except love when it begins. So let me tell all of you, what uh, the uh, WHO uh, scientist, chief scientist Soumya Swaminathan had also once mentioned, and this came through in the course of our speech, that these vaccines would prevent mutation, would prevent variants from coming through. And therefore, why does the side government win this debate? It wins on three primary factors. First, the urgency of the situation right now. We have seen not one, not two, but three or four waves coming through, and three or four kinds of mutants or mutant streams coming through. What has happened with voluntary vaccinations? The deaths are not stopping. Bodies are, bodies are being hid, hidden away, and yet it is being shown, for example, in India or any other countries as well. So the urgency requires that vaccination in this state that we are in is made a legal requirement and mandatory for all its residents. Secondly, the issue of herd immunity. It is pertinent and important that we reach herd immunity at the earliest possible time. And this flows not just from philosophers, but also from various legal justifications and cases, as well as medical practitioners, even the WHO at large, which has suggested that reaching herd immunity at the earliest possible time is the best means going forward. And the solution to that is vaccines made a legal requirement. Thirdly, they are painting individual rights, as I have already elaborated in my last speech. In our model, we also allow for individual rights being reclaimed. How? Through, through this qualified right of bodily autonomy or religious freedom being, uh, being taken out for just some time, they will again yet, they can again go back to the mosques, to synagogues, they can again assemble, and they, can, they will find the full expression of their individual rights in the model that the side government has proposed so far. Second, and finally, what do we, what they talk about the fact, they have not even dealt with the fact what my deputy prime minister had already showcased, that as the side government, we have to be concerned with our international standing at large as well. They have not stated that being committed to our international standards of preventing transboundary or cross-border harms falls within a state's obligations as well. We have seen, and let me not name the country, a country being questioned for not being able to curtail its COVID-related uh, problems within its borders, and its citizens being vilified and the, 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 their citizens being crucified to a large extent in various other places. Therefore, for all these primary four reasons, the side government overwhelmingly wins this debate considering the problems that at hand that exist uh, right now. Let me conclude by suggesting that in this world, nothing comes easy. Every vaccine in the world previously also has had its shortcomings. But this one will ensure that the world goes forward, economies restart, and we live our lives happily. Thank you very much. Thank you, Satak. I propose a big applause for all our seven excellent debaters. It's now up as a jury to decide who has won this debate. The jury will uh, leave this auditorium and we will have a, a three minutes uh, short break to give the debaters some time to compose themselves a little bit, to relax. And during this break, uh, this break I would like to, to hold a, a second poll uh, among our audience online. So, uh, 
we can observe which team or if the teams has managed to change the opinion uh, before the debate and now after the debates, so you can vote uh, just now, um, clicking um, the link or the QR code, and we will meet together in a few uh, seconds, a few minutes, sorry. Uh, we can have now, I should have received then, the result of the polls. So, um, the first poll was 59% against the motion and 41% for. The second poll is 53 against. So we can see that um, the percentage has decreased. And so second poll, 53 and 48 for the motions. So. It's not a big difference, and I can say that maybe both teams um, have been uh, uh, convincing uh, quite equal. It's not a big difference, but we can see the, the percentage against the motion as a little decrease between the two poles. Now uh, we can have... Uh, a short discussion, 20 minutes discussion between us. Uh, we can be relaxed. The debate is finished. Les jeux sont faits. Uh, the competition is over. Uh, we can try to find, uh, I would say, uh, convergent points of view and maybe help decision makers to find the best way to get out this pandemic. I please our streaming audience to send any questions uh, to the debaters that uh, this question we will bring here uh, around the table. All of you during the debates, um, you propose different arguments, political, ethical, sanitary, strategic, uh, geopolitical, legal issue. But I would say maybe the, the, the central question is to protect oneself or protect the others. And what, you, 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 you give us some numbers, but what numbers we have, what scientific studies we have today, uh, which would play for uh, the mandatory vaccination. Uh, we have the examples you, you of Israel, Great Britain, and so on. With that, what precise numbers we have which would be played for mandatory vaccination? Um, I Okay, I believe that when we're talking about mandatory vaccine, the number that is critical in the sense is in regards to vaccine hesitancy more than vaccines altogether. Because um, if you have a certain population, even in the majority that's vaccinated in itself, the argument that side opposition gave in regards to mutation and herd immunity still stands. Um, so I, I think it's fundamentally in regards to if you're looking at states that are arguably just vaccinating people voluntarily to a certain regard, there is a threshold that will be met. The question is that whether the threshold is enough to stop the pandemic altogether. And uh, in, in, in a country that is far more uh, let's say medical literacy, like the United Kingdom, that threshold is far higher. But let's say in a country like, uh, like India, for that matter, where it's the urgency to get rid of COVID rather than medical literacy that's driving the need, the threshold will be far lower. And I feel that that's where a legal mandatory nature and the urgency of it can play a role. But more, more, more than that, I think a, an information campaign will be more effective in like, here is why you should take the vaccine and this is the benefit of it. It's just not a crisis, but on the long run, this is what you will gain from it. But the question could be how high um, is the decrease of transmission if you are vaccinated? Do we know that? 
So uh, just I wanted to go back to the, the point you said before about numbers. Yeah. So there has been a, a research and a survey conducted uh, globally in more than uh, 30 countries, uh, which comprise of more than 50% of the population. And in this survey, uh, we saw that uh, vaccine hesitancy was on the rise. Over, over months because of misinformation, because of social media. So here it's where mandatory vaccination is important as well as awareness campaign and education campaign because uh, those hesitancy are the ones who um, will prevent us from getting herd immunity. And herd immunity is important. For now, we don't know yet about the threshold for herd immunity for COVID-19. We know that, for example, for polio, it's 80%. Uh, for measles, it's 95%. So it's really, really high. And if we uh, remove those uh, editants, then we could maybe reach it. And also, there is another important number, is the number of people at risk. The number of people who are too vulnerable to get the vaccine. For example, in Switzerland, it's around 2 million people, so around 20% of the population. So we definitely have to remove all those hesitancy to maybe reach this uh, herd immunity. And about the number you said about transmission, so there have been also many uh, research uh, conducted in several countries, and more specifically in Israel, because more than 50% of the population has already been uh, vaccinated. And those research show that uh, the transmission is stopped between 60 to 95%, depending on cases, but much more between 80 and 95%. So that's uh, really good. But 100% we, we will never reach. Sorry? Uh, I, I don't think medically it's possible to reach 100%. Uh, the mic doesn't... Uh, no, I don't think it's medically possible to reach 100%, especially given how short the time, timeline has been so far. And I think more than focusing 100%, it also has to deal with, like, vaccines aren't the final solution, like good hygiene and just inherent learned experience associated with masks, social distancing, washing your hands will play a long role in itself. And it's the incorporation of all the tools being proposed by the state associated with the vaccine that needs to be pursued. If I am right, it seems that um, the collective immunity is reached about, we said, by 90%. I'm right, yeah? 90% collective immunity? Uh, or less? Yes, so studies are being conducted still. Uh, like, for example, in various other diseases, it, it ranges between 70 to 95 percent, for example, in the case of smallpox. But so far, whatever studies have been conducted, it is around 80 to 85 percent or up, upwards of 80 percent for uh, COVID-19. But this percentage could play for uh, the freedom to be vaccinated or not. Because if you consider, OK, we, we reach uh, collective immunity, uh, without any people being vaccinated, I would say, why impose the, all the people to be vaccinated? So the reason is very simple, that we are witnessing deaths all across. The faster we reach uh, herd immunity, the less number of deaths can happen. So there is a, through voluntary vaccinations, we can reach herd immunity. But by that time, half of the world might die. For example, in the case of 19, 1918, in the case of Spanish flu, the second wave killed almost five to ten times more people than in the first wave. And that's why it's imperative that herd immunity is reached at the closest, at the fastest time possible. I, I think I disagree with that. Uh, I disagree with that because, for one, taking the case of the Spanish flu is one out of context because medical technology has, has really advanced in comparison. Mm. Secondly, when we go on to say, just equate like COVID is equal to death, we are not talking about the conversation about the role the health infrastructure plays. Like hospitals aren't ineffective. They can handle COVID-19 for a normal patient who's not at high risk. So the conversation about a legal mandated, legally mandated vaccine for high risk patients would probably be more skewed in favor of rather than just mandate for everybody. Like we need to probably identify groups that are more at, more at risk in terms of COVID-19 rather than just assuming that anybody who gets COVID, if, if not vaccinated, will die. That's not the, like the mortality rate of COVID-19 statistically is still low, but it's in certain groups that it's very high. 
and that's not something that we need to focus on. Maybe if I could just add, um, I think the reason why it has to be a legal requirement is because trust building takes time. You know, um, understanding exactly the science behind it takes time. Uh, we haven't even decided if pineapples go with pizza. I mean, <laughs> how sure are we that people will be convinced later on? But the thing is, we recognize that that type of decision making is um, it, it builds through time. And that's not something that we can afford at this particular juncture, where people have um, misplaced complacency. We think we're getting better, but suddenly we have the third wave, the fourth wave. We cannot wait for the 72nd wave and wait for everyone to change their mind. And I think that's the reason why um, there has to be an extra pressure to make people feel that your decision not to take part into this collective effort actually indirectly harms other people. Um, you want to add I, something? Yeah, yeah I want to add, I mean, I guess the question really boils down to, I mean, we all want people to be as vaccinated as quickly as possible. Uh, the question really boils down to, will mandate actually make it faster? Because mandate makes people suspicious about about, oh, why is, this, why is this necessary? Because if you don't give them enough information for it to be mandatory, they think it's against their right. So the question is, if, if let's say everybody is very well informed about the benefits of vaccination, then the mandatory has no additional pressure to the society. So the question is, if you think, the question really boils down to, you need to evaluate whether the mandatory of the vaccination will be effective or with a voluntary campaign through education is more effective. The, the goal is the same. Get as much people to be vaccinated as quickly as possible. The question is how? Because as we have seen, and through, because a lot of, a lot of scandals in, vaccin in vaccination as well, very few, I must admit. Uh, but the thing is that if you mandate it and people protest against it, you're not fulfilling your policy effectively. So that's the issue that we need to ask. Uh, if I can add something also, is that you can't assume that even if you mandate it, everybody will accept to do it. Like, I know people who are like hesitant about the vaccine, and if you put a mandate, even with that, they will never get vaccinated. Even if you put them in house arrest, even if they have to pay a fine, there's people who are just against that. So now it's a question about the efficacy of the mandate, is that we, we want to reach the 100% because people, some people want won't be able to take the vaccine because they don't want to. And especially, I think it's even more uh, complicated because people who are hesitant, they're hesitant about what? About the vaccine, about the scientific community, and about the state. And if the state say, oh, by the way, I do it my dentary, they will be even more suspicious. They will be like, what? Why are they doing this? Is, is this part of a conspiracy? It will even be a better point for the conspirationists. So I don't think it's helping at all. Um, Obviously, I mean, I think it also has to, uh, we need to remember that it's not a magic pill. When we do vaccination for all, it has to go with all other intervention, like what we said, education, it means we have to trust and rebuild those measures and tap on those channels. But I, I think the exclusive benefit is more of they don't have the ability to harm if they're just in their houses. If they are excluded from all other socioeconomic interactions like what we're proposing, then they might not get the vaccine in the worst case like you said, I mean, assuming but not conceding, but their ability to harm is significantly lessened. So I think if we could segregate population in that way and lift everyone towards the end, then it's still so much better than status quo. Yeah, I would add, my last question is about the borders, the states. We know that uh, every state, every government don't have the same politics regarding uh, illegal workers, uh, asylum seekers, or the facility to cut the borders. How should the states manage this problem to, to have a global cohesion, uh, I would say? This is actually one of the points Nevedat and I discussed during a discussion in the sense that, let's say, a state that is following human rights codes in regards to vaccinating its own population is exporting its vaccine to a state that isn't. How is that really that different from the idea of a state exporting weapons, even those claiming to say that it's a neutral state? So the idea of exporting values with your own vaccines 
need to be needs to be needs to run parallel. So therefore, when you talk about in international relations and states interacting on the basis of vaccine, it just can't be on the idea of statistics and output. It also needs to be seen whether my vaccine that that I develop with the values of human rights is being used on in 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 in, in light of violation of the same same values in some other place. So then, what is that vaccine truly achieving apart from immediate medical uh, immunity? But what is the long-term Im impact of that vaccine altogether in the international system? Uh, I have a question from, from the audience. Um, uh, is the selection of the vaccines a matter of state interest? You mentioned legitimacy and sovereignty and liberty, etc. But how um, about choosing some vaccines over others, like refusing AstraZeneca? It's sovereign too. Uh, I mean, yeah, that's that's a very credible argument, and that actually feeds into the vaccine hesitancy, right? Like because we didn't define which specific vaccine we're talking about, we didn't address that point. But we need, like, there is a significant amount of complexity in terms of which vaccine you're you're undertaking altogether, and which vaccine the state is giving. Because me, live, me as an Indian, might get Moderna and Pfizer, uh, and Pfizer which is 94 percent, while knowing AstraZeneca has a far lower thing, but it's been giving to my fellow peers back home. So that information altogether might increase hesitancy, saying I will wait when Moderna and Pfizer come to India, which can be a huge factor as to why vaccine hesitancy exists in the short term. So I'll just uh, make one comment there. So I think this whole issue of vaccine, it's, it's more of vaccine inequality around the world as to the kind of vaccines being exported. But we also have to look at the positives that so many vaccines are also being developed at the same time by various states. So I guess out of this, the easiest way forward is to understand that the vaccines are happening and it's not that the states are still waiting for making a vaccine and there is an effort being made but then we understand due to the whole inequalities between global north and global south this like what Ryan mentioned would exist and this is not just a personal question it's a question which multilateralism has to answer as to why these differences exist. But there is a link with a question we receive. Uh, there is no apparent criteria to receive this uh, vaccine, but I think that there are a lot of political criteria. For instance, we don't uh, here agree the Sputnik, the Russian Sputnik. We don't agree some uh, uh, Chinese vaccine. So uh, how would you, I would say, um, um, work for a globalization of the distribution of the vaccine? So I think COVAX as a facility on behalf of WHO is doing an incredible amount of work and politics is the norm for each and everything that's happening these days. So what we have to understand is have a, having our faith in our international organizations and institutions like Gavi, COVAX and like uh, WHO which can come up with the most appropriate ones and then suggest the way forward. But until then, obviously, states are making efforts, be it Russia or the US or anyone, and we have to respect that point as well. Uh, yeah, oh, you will uh, add something here, yeah, please? Yeah, I think it would be foolish to simply assume that larger geopolitics will not, at the end of the day, play a role in this, because certain bilateral or multilateral relations inevitably play a role. Like, even if, let's say, Russia's vaccine was 100% effective, there was no guarantee the United States would have allowed it that vaccine. It seems to be very effective, so Sputnik yeah, it, one, yeah? I mean, let's assume that, like, uh, Russia's vaccine was 100% effective. There was no evidence to show that the United States was going to accept that vaccine with no questions asked. And geopolitical trends need to be accounted for, but at the same time, don't need to be taken granted. Because we have seen certain trends develop which do not inherently abide by geopolitical trends, like countries in the, in the Indo-Pacific, which are now sort of being a little re uh, reserved against Chinese incursion, are accepting Chinese vaccines. So it's, it's just ge normal geopolitical behavior. During the debate, I was uh, interesting so, uh, through this argument about uh, how the mandatory vaccination could uh, in some way radicalize our societies, especially in our democracies. Uh, how, how, yeah, I would say, how, how can we avoid that? How can we, because we see that in every country, in our democracies, the trust uh, or the distrust uh, to the states uh, increasing. Huh? Mm -hmm. So how can we avoid that with mandatory vaccination, um, the, distress, the distress increase? Because it's a risk, no? Yes. I think that was my point. 
<laughs> I mean, I think we have to ground fear and mistrust. Um, when the pandemic struck, the situation changed because you look at each and every one you come across with as a threat to your life, a threat to the family you're going to come back to, right? That's, a, that's, a, that's what COVID made us think. But the way to, I think, the way to answer the culture of distrust is to ground it on rational solutions, to remove the threat, to make you feel, to, make, to remove the feeling of having to be in the defense. And the best way to do that is to get yourself protected, get the rest around you protected, so the, it limits the transfer, it limits the ability to harm. But also, again, if I could go back, the part that we minimize the chance of having even more variants in the future, because the virus might end with you. So the ability to rebuild trust, I think, roots from removing the threat first, and then you get them to the discussion table. You tell about your issues. I can trust you, and I can trust science, but as a journalist, I can see also how many complotist sites, how many complotist th th theories uh, rise all around the world. I mean, I'd, I, I'd argue that just have, sorry. sorry. I mean, um, just to add in terms of policy, I think um, the idea would be to ensure that you, you distrust a lot of people, but there are few people that you do trust. There are people in your community that you do trust. Uh, it could be leaders, people at the church, or you know, like uh, healthcare officials, etc. And to reach out to them and make sure that they are the ones delivering this message. It shouldn't come from people that you're more likely to distrust. And uh, policies can ensure that to some extent. Thank you very much. I see the jury has come back from the, the deliberation. I am impatient to know, and you also, I guess. Uh, I invite the jury to join me on the stage and the debaters to leave the seats and return in the auditorium, please, the members of the jury. So, this moment we'll, we'll have wait for almost two hours. I now ask uh, the jury uh, member to briefly comment on the debate and comment all the strengths and weakness of both teams. As I did before uh, with the debaters, uh, I please each one member to express in two or maximum three minutes. I thank you in advance for the brevity for that. And maybe we start with uh, Professor Surimur. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I would just like to congratulate both of the teams. It was a really terrific experience. You've all been working very hard, um, and both teams did a great job. So the, I cannot reveal anything about uh, neither the decision nor the deliberations, but um, I can say it wasn't easy. Um, maybe just a, a couple of quick comments uh, from, a, from a public health perspective, uh, which is, I think, the, the structure of the debate made it a bit challenging because we didn't talk about which country, right? We talked about the state in general. And I think one of the things that we understand about vaccine hesitancy, as well as uh, um, trust in governments, as well as access to vaccines, is that this, is, this varies hugely across countries. And so uh, a country in which you have already a high degree of mistrust, a uh, high degree of hesitancy, and perhaps limited access to vaccines, you might have a very different set of arguments than a country um, where you have a different situation. And I think that the reason I raise this is because um, I, I do think that uh, the teams did a great job marshalling political, scientific, uh, ethical arguments, um, but perhaps it would have been useful to consider what do these nuances of differences between countries mean for the overall argument and how can you bring, I think both teams um, can actually use those nuances to their advantage in talking about this variation among countries and therefore what do I want to say uh, either for or against uh, vaccine mandates. Uh, but overall really a terrific uh, performance and um, I have to say I, I, I serve uh, on, on the Swiss National Scientific Task Force, we debated this very topic, uh, and we would have benefited and learned very much from your, um, your research and efforts. So thank you. Thank you, you uh, Professor. And now uh, I give the, the floor to Ms. Rikita 
Can you too? Yeah? Please. Thank you for such an exhilarating evening. I thought both, both the teams did so well, and uh, we had a very hard time. And it's very difficult to follow uh, Professor Moon's comment on this, but I did think that both sides, the setting of the structure, because you know, of no uh, particular state was a tough one, and there was uh, difficult to have a middle ground in a debate like this, but I thought each one of the speakers did a terrific job with the replies and with their uh, position statements. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Mohamedou? Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Sorry. Just... Maybe. Uh, we have a, another one. We have another one. Thank you very much, and congratulations to both uh, teams. It was really, really enjoyable. Uh, we can't say much about what, uh, of course, will be uh, revealed in a moment, but I think most of the, what we've heard and however we, we sort of debated it amongst ourselves, because we had our own debates, which is something uh, of an interesting uh, development, um, I think was very much following from what you guys had been working on, which is uh, something that we felt was spirited, was very engaged, very respectful on both sides, and I think this is really, really the ethos and of what we're trying to do, civilized and disciplined, as I said. Time management was actually good, I think, in terms of how you both sort of did that. We, you didn't have to be interrupted too often by the moderator. Um, it was not too much emotion. I think it's also good that there was some emotion and, and how we looked at the engagement, the humor was certainly there. Uh, f uh, at times, and I think that that's very good. Something that we felt was very important, and I think we saw it in both teams, was the flow of the argument and the structure. As Suri was saying, this was a very important kind of aspect to this. Sometimes it was lacking in some of the uh, presentations, more than others, that's, that's normal. You weren't reading too much, although these were very complex arguments that you had to elaborate on. And I think this was really interesting for us to, to listen to you, in fact, and I think this ability to captivate the audience and, and, and the discussion was really important. The question of data was very important. Uh, some of you dealt with it more um, in a more disciplined way than others. Some of, them, some of you simply invoked it, and I think this was an important element to keep in mind. If you bring it up, you really have to engage with it in a way that it is um, compelling and, and, and demonstrating. Quotations, uh, Rolling Stones and MLK and uh, could have been Beatles and Malcolm X, but you know, that's just to each their own. <laughs> um, that's really, really uh, very interesting, of course, to have humor in that and engagement. And I think what was really interesting was this notion as well of the domestic and the international, which you brought together, the international obligations, but also the domestic citizenry, the, the rights of the citizenry. Something that I found particularly interesting, I think I saw it in pretty much every one of you, was the ability to redefine the question to the other team. And I think that's something we look for in the debates. There's a bit of a tension with how you have to be, remain structured, but I think also the manner in which you listen to the other side and try to sort of engage in redefining what they were asking, I think told us a lot about how you were also able to to acknowledge the argument on the other side, which I think is what, what we were saying was the, 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 the philosophy behind that. I appreciated the fact that most of you, if not all of you, announced what you were going to say. This is super important in a kind of a literacy dimension. I'm gonna do this, and you did it, and you followed through, as well as concluding uh, uh, in that sense. Uh, continuity of the argument, which is my penultimate point, I think was really, important. I felt that at times uh, s some of you had more continuity in the argument within the team and uh, that is also something that we need to see uh, I think as, as an overall kind of uh, element there. Um, and I think for me really important was to see the wider uh, questions, the, s the sort of societal issues and how these were uh, coming up in the conversation. All in all, a fantastic performance on, on both sides. Congratulations to, to both of you, uh, whatever the outcome is, uh, but certainly the idea of bringing us here for a, a first event, I think, and, and something that we wanted to create a tradition. It was really enjoyable. So thank you very much, and congratulations. Thank you, Professor. Mario Ramirez, please, add your voice to the jury. It has to be cleaned. Here, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. 
Well, I'll join my, my fellow uh, jury members uh, in the congratulations uh, to all the participants. I was personally thrilled um, to hear how, how enthusiastic and so much energy and how much passion um, there were in each of the, of, the, of the interventions. I think this is kind of the energy that we want to see in real um, action and in the real debates um, that, uh, that are taking place around, around this issue. Um, I, I, I really enjoy the diversity of the, of, the, of the arguments that cover legal, political, um, ethical, cultural, economic uh, implications and aspects of, of, of the topic. Um, on another side, um, I think vaccine mandate is not a black and white issue. And, um, and uh, we could have here a little bit more on, on the shades or, or, or on the process for us to, to support each of the arguments or what is it that could be done in between um, that could address some of the concerns that were raised by the, by the other team. But um, in general, a big congratulations. Uh, it was, it was uh, an excellent debate. Thank you. Thank you. And Professor David Silvian to conclude the speech of the jury. Well, just one more jury member. So again, I want to add my comments to those of the other members of the jury. Congratulations to both teams. I'm well aware of how much work went into this, uh, in part because I had seen the teams on two occasions before and practice sessions and so forth, and you guys did a lot of work, and um, there's, a, there's a very significant improvement, and so I want to congratulate everybody there. Um, just two or three points. Um, the one is that I thought what's, what's, um, what's significant about this is that each, each team did, I think, the, the minimum thing that it had to do, um, but to some degree, and this is just, as you, as you saw, it, it's very hard to speak extemporaneously, and to try to take prepared remarks and then insert other kind of comments along the way in them. And I thought, I thought the teams did a reasonable job. I think to some degree there was a, a feeling of ships crossing in the night, that they didn't actually engage as much as they could have. But it's very hard to do. Speaking as a former debater, it's a very, very hard thing to do. And it's easy afterward to remember all the things that you wish you'd, you'd said instead. So I think that that was, that was well done. There were some opportunities that each side could have really gone after the other one. Once in a while you did it, but I, I think that it was, it was a very good start. I did very much appreciate the, the humor and I appreciated some of the quotations and so forth. And I thought that the sense of going for the jugular but in a good natured fashion, if that's not a contradiction in terms, was, was, was very welcome. So I was, I was very, very pleased about that. And um, the only other thing I just wanted to say in my own capacity, and I haven't consulted the jurors on this, but I think they would agree, is I also wanted to thank the organizers of the debate, who I know, having received massive numbers of emails from them and so forth, put in an e a, a huge amount of time as well. So I'd like to finish by simply giving all of them a round of applause as well. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you to the member of the jury. I please allow you to return to your seat in the auditorium. And the most important moment of this evening has come. Est-ce que, Madame Dreyfus, vous pouvez me rejoindre sur scène pour remettre les prix aux vainqueurs? Voilà. Mettez-vous au milieu, là, là ou par là, comme vous voulez. Et je vous Venez prendre. Voilà. J'ai besoin d'un micro. Ah, you gave a micro to Mrs. Dreyfus, yeah. Voilà. Suspense. Are we ready? So, first, uh, the best speaker award goes to Sartak. Congratulations. Come on, congratulations. Congratulations. You were very convincing. Yeah, the gold medal for you. And we have a photography to immortalize this moment. Congratulations, Attack. 
Thank you very much. We wish you. Thank you very much. We wish you the best for your future. Thank you very much. Now, uh, I did also appreciate your speech. I have to say personally, but I cannot say because I was the referee. So, but I appreciate your speech. Now. Uh, the prize for uh, the best team in this first inaugural Geneva debate. And the best team is opposition team. Congratulations. So the best team received so the trophy. Yeah, take take it together. You deserve it. So uh, this price is. Uh, you have to know. I forget to say that it's a Lafayette Cup. Uh, I would say, uh, not in the memory, but um, in honoring Lafayette, which is, uh, I would say, like this institute, uh, worldwide, um, American, uh, European, Swiss, and so the organizers choose and uh, named this cup Lafayette. Lovely. Congratulations to you. And we have also a picture. Thank you very much. Bravo encore, à vous tous. Non, les médailles, c'est pour le team qui n'a pas gagné. C'est la récompense au team qui n'a pas gagné. So, uh, thank you for the winning team. Congratulations, best for your future. Thank you much. And so, I, I have to say also, uh, the other team uh, was very good. And congratulations, uh, you, can, uh, you can come uh, to have your medals on scene. The, uh, the, the other group, the, the other group who has not win, congratulations, you were also excellent, you know, so you deserve a medal. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Congratulations, sir, to you. You were uh, exceptional debaters, both teams. Merci, Madame Dreyfus. Merci beaucoup. Je vous laisse aussi retourner à votre... Elvin, uh, uh, what I forgot. I have still some medals for womb. <laughs> ah, sorry, I make... Uh, in the ceremony, I had a... For, 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 but, ah, that's the medals for the... for the not winning womb. Ah, sorry. Sorry, sorry. So... Last for medal for the other group. Sorry for that. Sorry for that. So please come, come, come to get. You were exceptional. So thank you very much. Sorry for that. Please. Yeah, yeah. You, you have to have a souvenir, memory of this evening. Thank you 
Thank you all for your work. You have trained very hard for that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we are now reaching the end. In a time of global uncertainty, a group of students decided to create this new event, which I am confident will trigger interesting and controversial discussions in the years to come. That is also uh, the role of our academic institution, like the graduate, and I am sure you agree with me, it has been an exciting start to a new tradition uh, at the Institute. Congratulations to the executive team. They are here. We can applaud them because uh, they, are hard, very, they have worked very hard to, to make this uh, evening a uh, success. On behalf of them, I would like to thank all the jury members for their contribution to making tonight's a success. A big thank also to the Graduate Institute for their support in hosting this event and uh, for uh, their support also the Centre uh, Albert Eichmann for la Democracy, Albert Eichmann Center for Democracy, the Global Shapers Hub, and the Forum Suisse de Politique de Sécurité. The team addresses also its remerciements to Professor David Sylvan, who has been dominated uh, beaucoup, beaucoup, uh, and who has done a lot, and who has entraîned the debaters de ce soir et pour son soutien donc euh, aux deux équipes. Euh, les organisateurs euh, would like also to think le domaine de Champ Vallon euh, qui euh, nous a fait le plaisir de mettre à disposition du jury pour le récompenser quelques excellentes euh, bouteilles d'un cru Genevois. Merci au domaine de Champvallon. J'aimerais évidemment vous remercier, euh, vous, Madame la Directrice, euh, pour avoir euh, accueilli euh, cette first Geneva debate. J'espère qu'il y en aura d'autres euh, ici à l'Institut. Distinguished organizers, students, debaters, partners of this event, and to all of the audience watching online, thank you for being part in this Geneva debate. It was a, really a pleasure for me to be the referee. We hope to see you next year for a second edition of this Geneva debate. Prenez soin de vous. À bientôt. Au revoir. Merci. Merci.